tonight. We're going to be talking on a, a subject that uh, I call fully charged. There's, uh, it's like being loaded up. It's like being fully stocked and ready to go. I guess about the happiest thing that, that would cause a lot of people to be happy these days is to be able to know my phone is fully charged. I can talk and talk and talk, and I can take pictures, and I can send them, and I am ready for the day, I'm ready for the event, and uh, that's, that's good news for us whenever it comes to that phone business, but whenever we are looking at scripture, there are various ones that come to mind. I guess one of the ones that, that causes me to think about even using this as a topic is from Psalm 68, verse 19. There's a passage there that says, Blessed be the Lord, who daily, and it depends on which translation you may happen to be using, King James Version says that daily loadeth us. And uh, the uh, English Standard Version, I believe, said, who daily beareth us up. That is, in that case, is suggesting he always supports us and supplies us and gives us what we need. That's the concept in the King James Version also, where he daily loadeth up. If you think about somebody being loaded, you might think that that refers to the fact that he's, he's very, very wealthy. You might mean that uh, he is somebody who has a lot of cash and that sort of thing. We use it that way. It might be that he feels very, very burdened. It might be that uh, he is on their hand, other hand, that he is challenged a great deal by the circumstance. I've got a full plate, we say. I've got all I can handle. I'm just I'm burdened with that. Or it might be that he was really saying, I'm blessed. I'm highly, highly blessed. Beyond the, you see some people who you can say, you know, how are you? And they say, better than I ought to be. And they speak about all the better than I deserve to be. And highly blessed, they say. God's grace is good, and he loads us with his benefits daily. We sing the song, count your blessings, name them one by one. Sometimes individuals may be saying, I can't go to sleep at night. One of the best suggestions probably in that is to start counting your blessings. And as you count the blessings and the good things that are in life, the ways that the Lord does load us and challenge us and give us what we need every day, we finally realize that, hey, it's morning. I, I went to sleep counting my blessings. I can wake up counting my blessings because God never ceases to give us the things that are needed and necessary in our lives. And there's life and breath and everything. James 1 and verse 27 says that every good and every perfect gift is from above, comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation, no shadow that is cast by turning. It's that totally consistent, nothing can get in the way, nothing can block it. God is blessing us all the time. One of my favorite expressions to hear people say, and it's based on Scripture, thoroughly it's based on Scripture, is to say, God is good. And we sing, God is so good. We sing it. We need to count on that and realize that this God is always conscious of us in everything. The 139th Psalm has the psalmist being amazed at the fact that the Lord is conscious of him, and then he goes to the extent of saying that God was aware of him whenever, and, and this puts it a little bit more biologically detailed than he does, but he speaks of when I was being conceived in my mother's womb. He's basically saying when the seed and the egg first joined each other, God noticed me then. And he's been conscious of everything I say and everything I think, Every danger, every uh, good thing that's happening, God is working in my life in every way. He'd already posed the issue back in the 8th Psalm in verse 4 and following, O Lord God, who is man, that thou art mindful of him. God notices us each one. It's just in itself the, the, the very 
epitome of the fact that God is every day loading us, that he's every day supplying us, and every day being conscious of us is putting us into the right place and the right time for the right situation, and our lives aren't characterized by accidents. Now, I know once in a while there may be some accident that, that happens in for instance, with two cars coming together and all those things where, where the laws of physics get violated and, and that's the consequence. But so far as that which God is planning for us, it's always good. In the book of Jeremiah, God speaking to his people, he said, I know the plans that I have for you. I have plans for you. And so he loads us in so many ways. The first point I had really that I wanted to discuss, actually I covered pretty much this morning and so I don't want to iterate the same things from this morning, but when I was thinking about the ways that God loads us, the things that he gives us that we may be able to use is, is the responsibility that he places upon us. There is uh, an honor that really is not describable that is inherent in the fact that God trusts us. When we are, if you're a, a parent and you have something very, very important that needs to be accomplished and you assign it to one of your children, there is a compliment to that child, whether he measures it or considers it or not, but you trust him. You believe he or she is mature enough to carry this out. It may be something that has a great deal that's, uh, that's weighing upon it. And the outcome of it may be heavy. But you're saying, I believe you can handle this. I believe you're displaying enough maturity you can be able to do that. And the child who measures it that way will do everything that he possibly can to please you, to honor you, and to fulfill the responsibility that's involved. When that comes, there's a, a passage we didn't look at today when I think about the responsibility that the Lord has given us, and that is whenever the Apostle Paul is talking about the mission in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he said that we then become ambassadors for him, beseeching you, that is our role as representatives of the Lord God Almighty, you know, Jesus the Savior, we become the ambassadors, the agents, the, the representatives to the lost world. We have become ambassadors for him, beseeching you in his stead. Be ye reconciled to God. We're given the trust of being able to place in our disposal the ability to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ to lost people. Jesus died for lost people. God sent Jesus for lost people. And now that Jesus has come and has lived and died and has gone back into the heavens, he's laid upon us the opportunity and the responsibility to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ to those people. I believe that's a a very, very high blessing, a very high compliment for him to believe in us enough that he would put in our hands. Paul said it's like a treasure in earthen vessels. A treasure we would normally think would be hidden away somewhere in some safe, safe place. And yet God has trusted us enough to put this message into our human hands and compliments us as he lays that responsibility upon us. And with that responsibility, he also gives us great opportunity. There's the passage in uh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 8. John is communicating the, the letter to the church in Philadelphia. And to this church, God says, you write to them that I have laid for, before you 
an open door of opportunity that no one can close. I put you in a time and circumstance and situation where no man can close this door. You can have success. You can accomplish great things. You can, as it were, testify and bear witness to me in so many ways by your lives and your words and all of that. I, I've just laid that out before you and no man can close it. Now, I realize that he is defining when he says no man can close it. He's saying it's not within the power of the human beings to keep that from ever happening. He is not saying that Satan can't get involved. He's not saying that some of the consequences of Satan's involvement may close that door. Sometimes we have individuals that come into our lives who seem just to be like the Ethiopian eunuch was when Philip came into his life. They, they seem just to be ready and open. They, they are teachable. They are receptive. They are willing. They are hungry. They are thirsty. And they're, they're searching for the truth about Jesus Christ and salvation. I'm not telling you Satan won't interfere with that. No man can. But Satan and his influence on people may shut that door, may close that mind, may take away that opportunity, which in itself illustrates how very, very important it is that we capitalize on every opportunity and that we not be people who postpone, who procrastinate, who put off, who seek a better time. I don't know how many times I'll have to tell you that, that I'm guilty here rather than pointing at someone else. Let me just say that uh, there have been lots of times I've met someone and I thought that person's teachable. And then I'm guilty of having said that when the time is right, when I feel like this is the perfect opportunity, I, I'm going to talk to them about the Lord. And some of those cases... The perfect opportunity, as I saw it, never came, and then it passed. It was my own hesitation. It was my own failure in those cases. God gave the opportunity, and I blew it. We don't feel comfortable with that, and yet we all would have to say, I know I've missed some opportunities too. So when God lays those opportunities before us daily, we need to be conscious of souls. Earlier in that same chapter in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul kind of makes that kind of admission himself. He talks about the fact in verse 16 that there was a time when he looked upon Jesus and he doesn't use exactly this terminology, but it's like saying, I looked upon Jesus as a mere man. But he said, I don't do that anymore. In fact, he indicated that he had come to the point that he looked at every soul. Every soul as though it was an open book. He looked at every individual as a soul that was searching and looking and now he had become a person who was soul conscious. And when we become really soul conscious, our evaluation of an individual when we meet them is not so much in terms of human terms and, and uh, uh, culture, uh, profession, wealth or position uh, in the community or anything like that, but our question is, here's a lost soul. What can I do to save them? And when we become soul conscious, we suddenly become aware of the fact that God did not stop with the putting of doors of opportunity before Christian people with the church in, Philippi, or in Philadelphia, but he, in fact, continues to do that all the time. And we when we become attuned to it, start to realize there's someone, there was someone today, tomorrow, I need to be watching. I need to be conscious. I need to be attuned so that I 
will not possibly miss such an opportunity tomorrow. Again, that's not a guilt trip situation, and I hope you sense that I don't mean it that way because I'm telling you I've done that. But the Apostle Paul said he did that too at one time. But he, he'd reached a point where apparently he's saying, I don't do that anymore. And we want to reach that spiritual point ourselves so that when those opportunities, we are daily blessed with a responsibility and then with the opportunity and uh, God is so good that he blesses us also with the empowerment to be able to do what he asks us to do. This morning we looked at Ephesians chapter 5 and 20 quickly as we talked about the fact that Paul said there is a power at work within us that is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. And we looked at Philippians 2.13 that indicate that power is God. But there's more in the equipping and the empowering of us than, than is suggested just in that. Because through the Holy Spirit, God has always provided also the teaching mechanism, and that is the Word of God. In Ephesians 1 and verse 3, the scriptures speak of that God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, I'm sorry, that's, that's uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's saying God has heaped upon us the empowerment and the illumination, the provision of the scriptures, and all spiritual blessings. And when Paul wrote to young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he, in uh, verses 16 and 17, he was speaking of this equipping whenever he, he'd urged him in chapter 2 of, of 2 Timothy, verse 15, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But he also said there in 3, 16 and 17 that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfectly and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So that whenever he needs to be able to teach someone, he's got what he needs. Whenever there's an opportunity to teach, God's Word has equipped and given him what he needs. If there's a struggle in his own life and he is conflicted by what's happening and what's going on and he needs a resolution, it's in God's Word. God has perfectly and thoroughly furnished him so that he can do the things that God calls him to do. This God who daily bears us up, who daily loads us with benefits, is conscious of the job we have to do, he trusts us to do it, and then supplies for us all the essential material that we are going to need, and provides for us salvation. He's given us salvation, and we, having salvation, are the ones who can share it with other people. What a great God that is. Romans chapter 5 is a, a wonderful, wonderful chapter. It starts out by saying that there now remaineth no more condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Try to fathom that. There remaineth no more condemnation to those who are in Christ. Now, that is not, it's used sometimes by folks who try to teach that once saved, always saved, or even saved by faith only. They're trying to, to make an easy, easy, nothing's required uh, on the part of the Christian in order to inherit eternal life. And so they, they don't give you all that that says in the King James Version, and they don't give you what's said in verse 4 in other translations. 
It says there remaineth no more sacrifice to, uh, for sin to those that are in Christ Jesus if they walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The contingency is that the people who are in Christ Jesus be actually really thoroughly converted and they follow in the footsteps of Jesus living spiritual lives. That's the condition. If they walk not according to the flesh, this translation and many other modern translations do not have that last phrase with a contingency in it. And some have really uh, felt badly about such translations that didn't have that. And they condemn it before they read verse 4, but in verse 4 it spells it out with greater detail than the King James Version does in verse 1. And there isn't a translation anywhere that indicates that the, con the fact that there's no condemnation has no terms and that it has no conditions anywhere there. But in verse 6, we are then reminded that when we were yet helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For us, when we were yet sinners, he died for us. And it goes on to talk about the fact that that's, that's just an unheard of thing. That uh, for a righteous man, where would you find someone who would die for a righteous man? Somebody might die for a good man, but, but that would be unusual. It's not just people don't commonly give their life for someone else like that. But he said that happened while we were your enemies. In verse 8, he said if, the, if he did that for us while we were yet sinners, while we were yet enemies, then in verse 10 he says how much greater then is going to be the gift and, and the love that the Lord's going to shed on us now that we're in Christ Jesus. It heaps up and heaps up and builds up the way that God has blessed us and giving us this hope of eternal life. And so we can know that we have that relationship with the Lord. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, John has urged in lots of ways tenderly through that book to children of God. Uh, things like uh, verses 1 and 2 of the second chapter, he said, My little children, I write these things unto you that you may not sin. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is a propitiation for our sins, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. I, I tenderly want you to know that we're trying to keep you from sinning. But if you do sin, I need you to know that there's someone who's already died to pay for your sins. But there in the last chapter as it's divided into chapters and verses in verse 13 of chapter 5 he said my little children I write these things unto you that you may know that you have salvation that you may know that you're saved I want you to know it the confidence that comes with knowing I have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am living in a lifestyle that is consistent with what he wants Christians to do. That's how I live. That's who I am. I'm sharing the gospel of Jesus with other people as best I can. I'm not perfect. I don't have to be perfect. But I know I was saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and I can know I continue to be saved because of the assurance. In that same book, in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, John said, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He's saying this blood is, it, the, the word for that is like a continuous action. It cleanses us. It's not that we got clean once and then we get dirty, but it continues to cleanse. Like the, the, the cycle in the washing machine that keeps on washing and washing and keeping clean in the same way. He's saying the blood of Jesus Christ keeps on cleansing us. When that's the case, we can be happy that we are saved, happy that we're the children of God. 
And with that, we have every reason to celebrate, to rejoice, and even to proclaim. In the 107th Psalm, and verse 2, the psalmist said, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let them say so. Let them speak up. Let them speak of the blessings of God and the salvation that shares through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm here to say, if we don't understand that the God of heaven daily bears us up and loads us with benefits and blessings, then life might be boring and life might be questionable and we might not be sure of our faith. But when we know that, we know we're children of God, a special people born again through the blood of Jesus. We count for something, and God trusts us. God wants us to fulfill. He wants us to succeed. He won't shut the door. We must comply and walk faithfully in the footsteps of Jesus. And we are, then Paul said, more than conquerors in Romans chapter 8. Not that we're going to win this thing 8 to 9 or 9 to 8. We're going to win this thing 1,000 to 1. That's more than conquerors. That's the God that wants you to win. If you're on the team, do what God asks you to do. If you have not yet become a part of the team, we urge you, do what God asks you to do. Do what he asks you to do to become a part of his family. Repenting of sin, believing enough in the Lord to that to move you to repentance, confess your faith, be buried with him in baptism, and he will wash away your sins in the blood of Jesus. And then if we walk in the light as he is in the light, Jesus said in Revelation 2 and 10, You'll be cast into prison, some of you. And you'll have tribulation ten days. But be thou faithful to death, I'll give thee a crown of life. He assured through the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, There is no temptation taken you, but that is common to man. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able, but with every temptation will provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. He will provide, and you can live for the Lord. If we can help you in beginning your journey today, or by returning to the route that you should have been on all the time, we're here to help you, and you need to let us know. We're singing a song of invitation, and we do invite you to respond to Jesus right now while we stand together and sing.